Hello, everyone. Welcome back for our final presentation. So um, as I mentioned before the break, um, we have our final presentation, which is Dr. David Head from the University of Central Florida presenting on slave smuggling privateers in the Spanish borderlands, geopolitics, and the illegal slave trade. And I must let you all know that I just asked Dr. Head how he got interested in the subject. And his answer was, I wanted to write about pirates. So he knows sexy history when he sees it. So. That's right, the ride. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's your next subject, right? Disney, doc, uh, Disney's interpretation of the pirate history. So um, Dr. Head received his PhD from the State University of New York at Buffalo in 2010. His research interests include the American Revolution, the early American Republic, the Atlantic world, maritime history, and pirates and privateers. Head's first book, Privateers of the Americas, Spanish American Privateering from the United States and the Early Republic, which is for sale out front, of course. Y'all should all buy a copy, and there it is right there. Told the story of seafarers in the United States who joined the Spanish-American Wars of Independence by sailing as privateers, attacking Spanish ships, and often returning to the United States with their booty. Head is currently working on three projects. He is editing an encyclopedia of the Atlantic world, editing a collection of essays on piracy, and writing a new book on George Washington, the Newburgh Conspiracy, and the demobilization of the Continental Army at the end of the Revolution. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. David Head. Well, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for staying around for the, uh, the last session of the afternoon. It's been a wonderful event so far. I enjoyed uh, last night's talk and then listening to everybody's uh, uh, remarks uh, this morning and this afternoon. So uh, I suppose all that stands between me and your, we your evening plans is me here. So I will uh, go through my talk um, as efficiently as possible. Okay, but I'll give you, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with uh, a lot to think about, hopefully, as we end things. Let me start with just a couple of uh, definitional things here to make sure we're all on the same page uh, in the title here. Um, I'm talking about privateering. We talked about this last night, but just as a quick definition, so we're all had the same idea in mind. Privateers are, well, I'll ask you, why should I do all the work? <laughs> Private, what's the, the distinguishing characteristic of a privateer? Right, they have a license, a commission that makes their actions legal and that then makes the transfer of property from the victim to themselves legal. A pirate doesn't have that, so it's an illegal taking from one party to the other. Okay. Uh, another, character, another key term here, Spanish borderlands. So I'm going to be talking about the regions of the United States that bordered Spain and its colonies that were seeking independence. So Spanish Florida, Spanish East Florida, Spanish West Florida, um, and uh, uh, in the Louisiana Territory, bordered up against Texas, which is disputed between the United States, Spain, and, and uh, Mexico. Um, so those are the regions that we're, that we're talking about. Geopolitics, finally, that's one that I'll use a lot over and over again. And that's kind of a shorthand that I've adopted to bring together a number of different ideas. Uh, by geopolitics, I mean the policies that are pursued by various nations and empires. Uh, policies toward, they're really their foreign policies, uh, national policies that have an effect on the relationship with other states, warfare. So I mean all of those things bound together under the heading of geopolitics. And I call it geopolitics because it's important how it plays out, all those different factors play out in particular places and in particular times. Okay, so that's kind of a catch-all phrase to denote the various policies, domestic policies, foreign policies, war, all right, bringing those all together under that one heading. Okay. All right, so I want to start here um, by a little giving you an idea of what the purpose, so what's new and different about what I'm saying versus what we've heard previously. So I think that historians have long recognized the importance of, this, of uh, slave smuggling that occurred after the uh, famous 1808 law. Uh, most often, I think, historians have emphasized that it was domestic pressures and interests that prevented the effective enforcement of that law. 
Historians have most often cited domestic factors such as the voracious demand for slaves, uh, particularly in the burgeoning cotton belt, the political strength of Southern legislators who sought to keep the anti-slave trade laws weak, and the bad behavior of officials who were charged with interdicting um, the traffic in human persons, the indifference, incompetence, their cheapness, the all too often uh, corruption of customs agents, naval officers, prosecutors are often blamed for the shortfall of the law. I think all these explanations are important. The demand for slaves surged in the early 19th century. Federal slave trade laws contained many deficiencies. Far too many officials uh, either ignored their obligations and even upright officials found themselves without sufficient resources to discharge their duties, even if they were willing. Uh, nevertheless, I think the emphasis given to domestic pressures and interests obscures the powerful influence that developments outside the United States exerted on the persistence of the foreign slave trade. And I want to say it's the decisive uh, influence that was played by developments outside of the United States. After all, uh, attempts to abolish the slave trade came at a tumultuous time in the Atlantic world. France had recently fought a losing battle to hang on to its crown jewel, Haiti. Britain and France were embroiled in a lengthy war that eventually drew in the United States in 1812. Spain's empire was in upheaval following Napoleon's conquest, and that development had triggered a decade-long war for independence among Spain's American colonies. Men such as Jean and Pierre Lafitte, they understood the complex geopolitical situation very well, and they used it to their advantage. They used the complex geopolitics of three interrelated conflicts. These are three interrelated conflicts that I'll talk about most frequently, and they are First, the Napoleonic Wars. Second, the War of 1812. And third, the Latin American Wars of Independence. And these are all connected into each other. The fog of these wars gave foreign privateers and their associates ample opportunity to smuggle slaves. They took advantage of loopholes in the law and weaknesses in foreign policy. Without foreign policy, uh, I'm sorry, without foreign privateering, far fewer slaves would have landed in the United States. And that's the crux of my argument and the bullet point that you should take away from the talk. So what I'm really arguing is that foreign privateering, without the foreign privateers, there would have been less slave smuggling. And what leads to the foreign privateers is this coming together of various geopolitical factors. So all the, when one leads to the other, absent any one of those, and there would have been less slave smuggling happening in the early 19th century. I'm going to talk now about a few uh, particular case studies, or uh, really about a few different areas, um, to illustrate what I'm talking about when I, I say that the, the influence of geopolitics was vital for spreading the smuggling of slaves into the United States. I'm going to start um, in the winter of 1809 and 1810. This is when the Louisiana coast really emerges as a center of both foreign privateering and the illegal slave trade. Slave smuggling, like any business, required a market, and of course Louisiana had a growing uh, market, fueled by cotton planting, sugar cultivation, the river trade through New Orleans. And of course, uh, smuggling doesn't exist without laws that restrict buyers' access to the goods, or slaves, that they want at the prices they were willing to pay. If there weren't laws restricting the supply of those uh, people and goods, what, what would it be called? Not smuggling, it would simply be it would just be trade, right? And then I wouldn't have a talk. It would just be, <laughs> just be regular trade. Okay? So it's the laws that are a critical factor. The internal demand uh, for slaves was strong, but I think it was ultimately the ways in which the Napoleonic Wars were unfolding that brought significant numbers of new foreign slaves to Louisiana. In the winter of 1809-1810, France lost the last of its Caribbean islands to Britain, and that brought a wave of French privateers to the Louisiana coast. Two years later, the crisis of legitimacy in the Spanish Empire that had been touched over by Napoleon's actions resulted in Cartagena declaring independence and commissioning privateers. Cartagena is where today? Columbia. In Colombia, right? So it was, a it was a independent, it was a city state that had declared its own independence, uh, in well, independently, of the other uh, regions within what would become Colombia today. Uh, as time went on, 
practical considerations and the progress of the wars led foreign privateers to sell their cargoes in Louisiana rather than in the port of some other country. France was a long way away from the Caribbean. And although distance was less of an issue for the Spanish-American vessels, their home ports were often unstable, producing less than ideal market conditions. Furthermore, the revolutionary governments in Spanish America had outlawed the slave trade. Mexico had done so in 1810, Venezuela in 1811, and Cartagena in 1812. Now those laws, they were flouted, they weren't perfectly enforced, uh, they were better enforced once independence was fully achieved and those governments could exert some more control over their borders. So it's not as if there was no slave, sla new slaves introduced to those countries. But still, if privateers with slaves, if they're going to break the law regardless of where they, where they landed, well, then they might as well come to Louisiana, where the planter class, safe from the ravages of war, really wanted to buy slaves for their labor. The demand and the geopolitics of privateering went hand in hand. This is a point brought home by the privateer's fondness for hunting off of Cuba. We've heard about Cuba previously. Uh, and we've heard that uh, unlike most of the other colonies in this Spanish-American uh, world, Cuba remained loyal to Spain. In 1810, Spain continued to have the international slave trade. So the slave trade was flourishing right off of American shores and that presented an inviting target for privateers. I think here's a, a critical geopolitical point. In a different world, one in which Cuba had also sought independence, I think you would have seen far fewer slaves landed in the United States, simply because the, the, the uh, different political situation and the geography right, would have played out differently. But that's not the world we actually lived through. Like Cuba remained loyal to Spain, and therefore there's a slave trade to, those, to that island, and there are privateers who could go easily from Louisiana coast to off of Cuba, and then back again. Uh, privateers hoping to sell slaves in Louisiana followed the same basic strategy as those who were bringing in goods. Uh, we can take a look, take a look here at the, um, at the map. Many of you are familiar with the geography. Okay, but the, we'll reinforce things. Uh, they would land at Barataria, sell the slaves on the spot, receive help from others to transport the slaves. One example, uh, a group of French privateers landed 113 slaves on Cat Island, which is near the mouth of the Bayou Lafouche. In another instance, I found evidence of a group of French privateers who landed 91 slaves and sold them for an estimated $5,000. Similarly, a man named Pierre Lequet. Actually, that's probably not how you pronounce the French, is it? No. Uh, it's a lot easier when you just write it out. And I remember, oh, I got to say this. <laughs> In my mind, when I'm writing it, I'm doing, you use the phonetic pronunciation. So it's like, spell it right. Okay. All right, uh, please be gentle in my French pronunciation. Uh, commander of the Cartagenian, uh, a Cartagenian privateer brought in 570 slaves into Louisiana. Now, to find the law to deliver goods and slaves to Louisiana's coast worked well for some privateers. It was quick and efficient, thanks in no small part to the Lafitte's. Other privateers took a different approach and attempted to enter New Orleans itself, not so much by avoiding the law, but by using the law's weaknesses to their advantage. The biggest loophole available to privateers was an exemption to port entry regulations. And this exemption was granted to vessels that were said to be in distress. So the, the distress exemption. Uh, United States law permitted neutral foreign vessels to enter US ports to receive shelter from storms, to replenish low supplies of food or water, to repair damage, and even to escape enemies. Claiming distress appealed to privateers with slaves. For example, in 1810, the Massavito a Portuguese slave ship that had been captured by the French privateer captain Louis Michel Ory entered Louisiana by claiming distress. The vessel entered the Mississippi in need of provisions, is what the, uh, the, the master of the ship said. But it stayed in the lower river near the Belize, an outpost on the river's mouth, where pilots waited to guide ships in and out, and the Customs Service maintained an, an inspection point. The Belize. Down, would have been down here, so a long way up to New Orleans. 
Uh, once resupplied, the Massavito left the river and made the short hop west to Barataria, where the, where the vessel's master landed 105 slaves and sold them to a slave dealer for $17,000. The slaves were then mo moved off the Bayou Lafouche to Donaldsonville. From then, you get the back uh, door entrance to New Orleans. Another privateersman, uh, a Frenchman by the name of Marceline, ordered a prize slaver all the way up to New Orleans while claiming distress apparently confident that the slaves aboard would not be seized. In June 1810, his ship, La Epine, captured the Spanish slave ship Alerta off Cuba with 170 slaves. And thank God for that name of the Alerta and not a Spanish or French name that I can <laughs> easily pronounce with confidence before you. Uh, according to one Spanish sailor, the uh, French commander took off uh, in the sailor's words, 15 of the finest looking Negro boys who were then sold at sea to an American sea captain. The rest were sent aboard the Alerta for Louisiana, most likely with orders to enter the river claiming to need repairs. Testimony about the Alerta's condition is conflicting. It's not entirely clear how damaged it was. Uh, at one point, the pilot who guided the Alerta up the river swore he found the vessel, and these are his words, in a situation the most wretched and deplorable, liable to be wrecked with the first breath of wind. He, the, the pilot went on to say that the crew and the slaves were, as he said, all endeavoring to pick up a miserable and precarious subsistence by catching pelicans for their food. Now, isn't pelican is the state bird, right? Well, that's, just, that's just rude to, to eat the state bird. But that's what they're doing. At another time, the same pilot indicated he simply saw the crew killing birds and salting them, perhaps for amusement more than anything else. I, mean, I think that's worse, probably, if they're just shooting the birds for fun. Uh, whatever the case, the French captain sent instructions for the Alerta to send the slaves to a Mr. Michel in the city for safekeeping until he could arrive to claim them as his property and transport them out of the city, certainly to smuggle them somewhere else. In a similar case, the Spanish slave ship Josefa Segunda, which was prized to a Venezuelan privateer called the General Erosmendi, ended up in Louisiana by claiming distress as well. The ship arrived in 1818 with 165 slaves. Out of an estimated two to 300 that had been present upon capture, uh, some of the slaves had died or had been sold near Cuba. A pilot, again, attempted to back up the distress claim and he testified that the ship's ropes were in very bad condition. This is the way he described them. He said they were so bad that, as he said, there was not one on board fit to hang a cat. <laughs> you can you imagine when I read that for the first time in the, in the manuscript, you're trying to puzzle out what it means, and he said, does that say hang a cat? <laughs> no. Well, that's the only thing it could be. Uh, so fit to hang a cat. He said the slaves were in wretched condition, nothing but skin upon their bones. The judge of the federal court in New Orleans, though, he was suspicious. He didn't buy this claim of distress. He said, uh, the truth is, other ports might have been entered far short of this for provisions and refitment had the distress been real. But no place offered the prize master so good a market for his slaves. $1,000 a head is greatly tempting. Foreign privateers seemed to land slaves so easily that it's natural to wonder if law enforcement was even trying to stop them. Officials complained all the time about the popularity that the criminals enjoyed. But stopping smugglers and privateers was much more difficult than simply investigating crime and prosecuting the offenders. Right, it's not like an episode of Law and Order where there's the crime and then they had the whole trial by the end of the hour. Uh, the geopolitics, I think, is the critical factor again. Geopolitics not only created conditions favorable to the lawbreakers, but it also presented authorities with immediate dangers that made slave smuggling a lesser priority for them. For example, the diplomacy of US neutral, world, I'm sorry, US neutral relations with Spanish America constrained authorities' ability to act. Customs collectors knew to be suspicious of foreign privateers claiming distress. I mean, they weren't, they weren't naive. They knew that this was a potential problem. Yet they never received instructions from Washington requiring them to take any precautions other than the normal vigilance that their position required. The policy of just, you know, keep an eye out, 
do your job the way you usually do. That became official in September 1815 when President Madison issued a proclamation of neutrality in Spain's war with its colonies. Though declining to recognize the independence of the Spanish colonies, the United States did recognize the belligerency of the combatants. Now that's a key, um, a, a key point there. By recognizing that Sp Spain and its colonies are engaged in a real war, that they're both legitimate belligerents, that obligated the United States to treat both sides equally. As a result, closing the distress exemption became impractical. The United States wanted to close the distress exemption. They could have barred all Spanish-American vessels from New Orleans. They could have said, the port's closed to all Spanish-American vessels. That would have certainly kept out the privateers attempting to smuggle slaves. But not all such vessels used distress wrongly and closing New Orleans to all Spanish-American privateers would have shown favoritism towards the Spanish. The United States would have failed in its neutral obligations, would have been de facto supporting Spain. Additionally, barring Spanish-American vessels from U.S. ports would likely have caused the governments of those nations to bar U.S. ships and U.S. sailors from their ports. So think for a second. You're sailing to Cartagena. You're caught up in a storm. You wash ashore on, on, the, on the beach of South America. You say, can I please come aboard? I have shelter from this storm here. I'm in bad shape. And the officials say, no, get out. Our, our port is closed to you because your country has closed its port to our ships. That would have been bad for American sailors who might have been shipwrecked uh, somewhere off the coast of a Spanish-American country. And so that uh, argued against the United States barring all, all Spanish-American ships from U.S. ports. The War of 1812 likewise interfered with the more vigorous enforcement of the law. Wartime policies on both sides increased the incentives for smuggling. Uh, the undersourced naval station at New Orleans busied itself preparing defenses around the city to protect against a British invasion, leaving fewer men available for anti-smuggling duty. Because Think of the comparison. The British are coming to conquer your city. Well, let's go patrol for smugglers instead. Uh, probably that's not going to be a very effective argument. Uh, the Navy officers actually liked this. They were very they're happy to be able to fight against the British rather than to continue on smug anti-smuggling duty. Uh, anti-smuggling duty that there's no there's not considered not as honorable as fighting a fellow officer and gentleman of the British Navy. Uh, they were uh, U.S. naval officers tasked with anti-smuggling duty. They were concerned that this would harm their careers because they wouldn't uh, get recognition. The study found that they were right, that officers who were stationed in New Orleans advanced more slowly than officers put on other stations. Okay, so their careers were harmed, and they were excited that they would get to fight the British rather than having to continue to uh, try to stop smugglers. Uh, wartime trade restrictions uh, increased the, the incentive for smuggling goods. And of course, the smuggling of goods went hand in hand with foreign privateering and the smuggling of slaves. Even when the Navy did strike against smuggling and privateering and slave trading, the geopolitics intervened to stop the progress they were making. In September 1814, a joint Army-Navy force raided Barataria, seized vessels, made arrests. The Lafitte's, who were operating there, they escaped, but they lost a significant portion of their property. Now that should have crippled the Lafitte's business, and that should have that, that that could have been it for them, except the geopolitical conditions intervened. Uh, with the British invading Louisiana, of course, the famous story that the, the officials here thought they would need every last man to defend the city. They emptied the jails. They promised pardons for anyone who participated. The smugglers and privateers and the Lafitte's joined in. They uh, helped defend the city in whatever small way they did. Uh, and they earned the pardons after the war. So the Lafitte's were saved and able to uh, get on the right side of the law because the British were invading at that particular moment. The British don't invade New Orleans. The Lafitte's probably never get back uh, on the right side of the law. Okay? But they're saved and given a reprieve for their business for the moment because of the geopolitical conditions. Now to move into the post-1815 uh, period, so after the Battle of New Orleans, to talk about developments after the Lafitte's uh, had their business operations in Barataria disrupted. 
because they go back to their old business in a few years. So slave trading into Louisiana continued following the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, 1815 marked a watershed moment of peace in the United States, but the Latin American Wars of Independence went on. And in fact, they entered a new phase that unleashed even more privateers. When Napoleon was vanquished uh, from Spain and King Fernando VII returned to the Spanish throne, he began undoing the liberal reforms that had been made during his captivity, while seeking also to bring his American colonies back under his control. Former colonies in South America commissioned privateers. In Mexico, the Spanish uh, reconquest progressed happily for the king's troops during 1815 and 1816. But the more desperate times there called for various independence movements, created um, opportunities for small, mostly self-created projects that brought filibuster expeditions into contact with privateers, smugglers, and slave dealers in and around the United States. So two factors are coming together to encourage privateering. On the one hand, uh, more South American countries uh, are uh, preparing to fight against a potential Spanish invasion by licensing their own privateers than they had it done previously. And even in places where Spain is successfully reconquering territory, such as in Mexico, the Mexican independence movement, they don't have anything to lose but except uh, by sponsoring these uh, expeditions, military expeditions called filibusters and privateering. So even so successful or not, it encourages more privateering in the future. Uh, one such effort undertaken by Mex the Mexican independence movement found a haven in Galveston, an island off of Texas in a region, very critically, that was claimed by the United States and Spain and Mexico. So here, here is Galveston. Right? Galveston is here. Okay. Mexican patriots had been trying to find a port from which they could base their operations. Uh, they wanted a port that was close enough, that was close to the United States, so they could receive shipments of supplies and munitions from a uh, US port, well, Louisiana being the, the closest one. Uh, they wanted uh, to have a place where they could send goods that had been captured when they sponsored privateering. So a place close enough to the United States to be, have access to the supplies and to markets. Uh, the first years of the war had brought scant success, but a breakthrough came in August of 1816 courtesy of Louis-Michel Ory, the former captain of the French privateer Guillaume and a one-time smuggler of slaves from the prize Massavito. So we've seen him before, he shows up again. Uh, Ory, since we last saw him, had followed a route through French privateering, then he joined the Cartagenian Navy, he earned the rank of Commodore, became an associate of Simon Bolivar, he then uh, joined a Mexican filibuster operation Apparently, Bolivar did not give Ori the respect that Ori thought he deserved, and he said, well, I'll forget you, I'll go do my own thing. And then he ended up uh, joining in the operation out of Galveston. Uh, Ori attracted many privateers, but he wasn't an especially good leader. Uh, he seemed to irritate his followers. The fact that he crashed uh, four ships heading into Galveston probably didn't inspire confidence. It could have been five. Come on, give him some credit. So it wasn't good. Uh, and his followers, they did more fighting with each other than they ever did attacking Mexico, privateering. So his rule uh, collapsed over time. At the same time uh, that uh, Ori was trying to get his operation up and running, Jean and Pierre Lafitte staged a comeback. Following the Battle of New Orleans, the Lafittes had switched their loyalties, and they actually enlisted with Spain as secret agents. They became spies. Uh, dedicated to providing information on Spanish-American privateers and filibusters. Apparently, they were recruited into the spy ring, or at least uh, Pierre was, right, uh, right over by the, um, or their handler was the priest, the rector of uh, St. Louis uh, Cathedral, uh, right, Pere, Pere Antoine, and they apparently met right, right next door there, so, so it was good. Um, the Lafitte's, they get going to take this mission, like, we're, we'll go gather inf uh, information on Galveston. Then they see that, Lord, uh, that Ori is weak there, and they take the, over the opportunity to push him out and take over Galveston, all the while telling their Spanish sponsors that, yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're going to close things down soon. It's just, just a few more privateers to come in, then we'll have more stuff to take, and yeah, just be patient. We'll do it eventually. 
of course, the whole time that they're just kind of stringing them along. Uh, regardless of who was commanding, either the Lafitte's or their predecessor, Ori, Galveston became a slave emporium. Prizes landed at least 300 slaves in Ori's first year, and Ori had personally captured an additional 700 slaves, although he only landed 400 since uh, he cast one vessel adrift when he discovered an illness had broken out on board. So I just set him loose to, yeah, yeah. The 400 slaves, there's an illness, they had a fever or something, so it's, you know, just abandon the ship and uh, let them starve to death. So um, once Ori was out of the way, the Lafitte's again acted as middlemen, which seemed to be their particular skill. Now, corruption did play a role. Uh, we've heard the story about the uh, Bowie brothers and their inventive use of the uh, incentives that were in place for reporting uh, legal slave smuggling. I came across another example of uh, official corruption or at least it was a plan for corruption, it, it, a plan that apparently never was uh, fully brought off. But here's the plan, here's the scheme. A New Orleans lawyer named Pedro Riano and a man named Mr. Andre. That just sounds like somebody who'd be up to no good, right? <laughs> Mr. Andre. Uh, they approached a deputy U.S. Marshal named Joseph Doriak, and their proposal was to steal slaves from planters who had smuggled those slaves from Galveston. So when, the, so when the slaves are being transported from Galveston to Louisiana, their scheme is to steal them on the way. Here's how it would work. Doriac would serve a court order on the planters, right, saying, we've heard report that you have illegal slaves. Right? And he would seize them, take the slaves into the custody. On the way back to New Orleans with the slaves, Doriac would be ambushed by Riano's men. Riano gave these instructions, he said, you will defend yourselves feebly and finish up by delivering the Negroes. Andre would then sell the slaves and the, uh, the three would uh, split the proceeds. So, gonna, so Riano's guys are going to steal them from Doriac, and then Andre's guys give them, I'm sorry, um, Riano's guys give them to Andre, Andre would sell them. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, Doriac then, when he comes back with no slaves, uh, that he was supposed to seize. He was supposed to tell his superiors that he lost them to robbers, which was, I guess, true. Uh, and Riano promised, very helpfully, to provide witnesses who were prepared to perjure themselves to, to verify the story. This Riano is very helpful, providing all these different services. Uh, the plan never materialized. It's not clear why, what, what went wrong. Uh, Riano was arrested for contempt of court. Uh, that, that's how it came into the, the court system to find out about it, but I mean, theoretically, this, this could have worked. This could have worked out if everybody had played their assigned role. Now, the behavior of officials such as Doriac contributed to the flouting of the slave trade laws. At the same time, slave smuggling through Galveston also depended on exploiting the geopolitics of relations between the United States, Spain, and Spanish America. Again, an example. Uh, one of the advantages offered by Galveston was its geopolitical status. Since it was claimed by the United States, Spain, and Mexico, U.S. authorities could not move against it without upsetting the Spanish, who would surely see any action against their territory as just the first move towards a full invasion of Texas. The Mexicans would also be angry, as they would see this as interfering in their war against Spain as, being favor as favoring Spain and not upholding U.S. neutrality. So they couldn't get at the source of the problem without angering two other parties. Meanwhile, uh, Ori had a claim to legitimacy that had allowed his vessels to access U.S. ports. Shortly after arriving at Galveston, a representative of the Mexican Congress helped establish a government for the island. He administered an oath of allegiance, and he named Ori governor. As a result, Governor Ori issued documents such as manifests, custom clearances, and the privateering commission that U.S. officials felt bound to respect. Here, here's an example of um, a couple of commissions. I like the little ship in the one. That, that's a nice touch. Uh, actually, the, the ship itself, you can read it very, very uh, closely there. It's a very small ship. I like how... The, the, low, the, the image there has three masts. It looks you know, huge and stout. Um, but this is what the commission looked like. Now, 
it's easy to be doubtful about the legitimacy of all this and who is this government, this Mexican official. I mean, Mexico doesn't really even have a government at this point because they've been conquered by Spain. And it's, you know, a guy who says he has a connection to the government that no longer exists. Okay. So it's very easy to be doubtful, and especially since Ori was slave trading, and the whole point was to break uh, U.S. customs and neutrality law. But if you have a U.S. customs official, and a ship shows up, and they have the right paperwork, and it says it's from an official government, and the United States has taken the position that Mexico is a legitimate um, belligerent in their contest against Spain, you know, what are you really supposed to do? If you deny accepting these documents, the U.S. official is effectively saying, you know, Mexico's not a real country. You're not really engaged in, in a war, a legitimate war against Spain. And that would be a violation of U.S. neutrality. So the United States is not upholding its neutral obligations. And so they give the benefit of the doubt to these commissions and to this paperwork because ORI has this, uh, this least claim to legitimacy. And so it's not as clear cut as it might seem. Uh, Here is uh, the actual words of some of the officials. Uh, in 1817, the, the New Orleans customs collector, a man named Beverly Chu, he admitted that, uh, this is in testimony in a, in a court case, these, these are his words, he said, there's a regular intercourse and trade between this port and Galveston. The former uh, customs collector, Pierre L.B. Duplessis, he also was called to testify, and he affirmed that it was Treasury Department policy to treat, as he said, all vessels under the Mexican and other independent flags upon the same footing as vessels belonging to old Spain. After all, the United States had recognized that a legitimate war existed between Spain and its colonies, and the law of nations demanded that neutrals treat both sides equally. So the policy made sense. Uh, if the slave smuggling through Barataria and Galveston were not enough to overwhelm U.S. officials, there opened a third area of uh, smuggling. And that was brought about the, by the progress of the Spanish-American Wars. Uh, in June of 1817, there's an invasion by an operative uh, claiming to represent the Spanish-American governments, a man named Gregor McGregor. It's a wonderful name, Gregor McGregor, uh, on Amelia Island in Spanish East Florida. So this, this is Amelia Island in Spanish East Florida. The yellow part, the yellow part is East Florida, the province, the uh, state of uh, East Florida. And then this is a modern map here showing you exactly where Amelia Island is and it's uh, very close to the border of Georgia. And in this area, in the 19th century, that's, the diff that's a national border. So that, that's Spain and the United States. So Spanish Florida and American Georgia. So an attack led by Gregor McGregor. He had been, he was a Scotsman by birth. Well, didn't need to say that, did I? You could have guessed where he's from. She said, no, he's actually Italian. Uh, OK, so Gregor McGregor, he had been a British officer. He uh, had served in the Peninsular, Peninsular Campaign of the Napoleonic Wars. He didn't get the rank that he wanted. So he said, you know, I'm taking my ball and going home. And he ended up in Venezuela, where he offered his military service to the Venezuelan government. He ended up marrying the sister, I believe, or cousin of uh, Simon Bolivar, which then helped his advance his career. And he became a general in the Venezuelan service. And he got into some other argument about his rank. And he left it for his own uh, project to attack uh, Spanish East Florida. He gathered a force in the United States. They launched their operations from Georgia, just over the border. And they fairly easily ran out the, uh, the force that was defending Amelia Island. His rule on Amelia Island only lasted a couple of months because the plan was to first secure Amelia Island and then he had arranged for supplies to come and you know, he'd resupply his efforts. But the supply ship never arrived, at least not with the supplies that he anticipated. It had been detained in New York. So ships comes and mostly empty. And then McGregor, McGregor gives up because he doesn't have the supplies to keep going. Two days after that, after he decides to give up, he's replaced by another person. Can anyone guess who, who shows up again? Ori. Ori shows up again. And he replaces McGregor on, on Amelia Island. Yeah. yeah, Ori's great. He's everywhere. He goes back again and again. Um, and yeah, he, uh, in the early 1820s, he dies in the early 1820s at the age of 28. So he did this in a very short amount of time. 
I lived a very short life, but very, very, uh, very productive. Um, the proximity of Amelia Island to the United States and the abundance of legal loopholes that went along with that proximity was indispensable to operations on the island. Ori obtained arms and munitions in Georgia and had them brought over on rowboats. U.S. Customs Law required official clearances only for vessels larger than five tons. Tons is a measurement of volume, not weight. So that's not, that's not very large. Uh, the reasoning was that anything smaller than five tons cannot get very far and wouldn't carry very much in goods to make it worth the time of inspecting a, a, a vessel that small. Okay. Uh, thus, uh, rowboats could come and go as they pleased. If officials didn't need to inspect them, didn't have any real reason, any authority to inspect them. Uh, a U.S. naval ship, uh, the Brig Sarnak, it, it did seize a small boat transporting naval stores going into Amelia Island. The collector at Savannah let it go when it was brought in for adjudication, since it had broken no law. It was too small, didn't need to report what it was, what it was bringing out. Uh, small boats and the border also came in very handy for slave smuggling. On some occasions, slaves were rowed to Georgia with the slaves themselves assigned to do the rowing. Uh, the commander of the U.S. Naval Station, a man named John H. Elton, this is what he reported to one of his superiors. He said they can smuggle one or two, one or two slaves, at a time without detection. Other times the slaves would be sold to dealers at, uh, who come to Amelia Island, and the dealers would take them to the mainland. They would follow the St. Mary's River, that's the border, on the Spanish side till they got you know, 50 miles inland far outside any patrol area for customs officials, then they could cross over the river into Georgia and the United States undetected. At the same time, vessels, privateering vessels that operated out of Amelia Island were protected by a measure of sovereignty and America's commitment to neutrality. In one instance, uh, Commander Alton, he spied a prize heading into Amelia. He said, I would have taken her out immediately, he wrote this to the Secretary of the Navy, but I considered it neutral ground and it was the wish of the government not to infringe. Over and over, Elton asked the secretary for guidance. So he, a quote from one of his letters. I have several times written for instruction how to act as regards the patriots or people of Amelia, and particularly whether I am expected to detain vessels freighted with slaves. Without instructions, Elton confessed, my judgment would dictate that I had no right to intervene particularly if we considered the place a neutral place. When one privateer owner asked Elton to ensure him that the Navy would not seize his vessel, I wonder how that conversation went. Uh, I'm planning on doing something that you might consider illegal. Could I really do this? I mean, will you stop me or not? Or, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> so one privateer owner asked Elton to assure him that the Navy would not seize his vessel. Elton gave him the only answer he could. He promised to, to treat McGregor's flag as the flag of a neutral, and unless some very flagrant cause should exist, I have not any directions to interpose with it. Uh, this is McGregor's flag. And this is McGregor here, his flag. Apparently, this is a flag of his own design. So he's multi talents. <laughs> okay. So that's the flag that, if you show that flag, that. Well, we have to respect it. It's a neutral, it's a neutral flag. <laughs> Overall, slave smuggling was one of the most important activities on Amelia Island. Uh, McGregor had barely taken control when a dozen slaves left behind by the Spanish who had fled were put aboard a small sloop and sent into Georgia. Following McGregor's example, privateers brought at least eight slave vessels to Amelia in the fall of 1817. The U.S. Navy seized a good number of them, although, of course, that generally did not preserve the people captured from a life of servitude, since they were then eventually sold in Georgia by the government. Altogether, approximately 450 slaves were landed at Amelia successfully, with another, 400, uh, I'm sorry, with another 500 intercepted by the United States. It's possible that the number of vessels landing slaves was actually higher, given that naval officers often complained about not being able to detain privateers and their prizes. The smuggling done at Galveston and Amelia represented a large-scale attempt to flout the anti-slavery laws. The demand for slaves was certainly a factor, and all too often officials looked the other way. 
Yet the most important pressures that created slave smuggling at this time came from abroad, and were and they were uh, came from the forces of maintaining neutrality. If Spain had not been at war with its former colonies, there would have been no Galveston and no Amelia Island operations on the same size, on the same scale. Right. The physical islands would have existed. The, the operation of smuggling slaves wouldn't have been the same scale. It's foreign privateering made possible by, by the geopolitical situation that made the difference. Now how things came to an end. So the conclusion of the foreign uh, foreign privateers and the slave trade. The influx of slaves made possible by foreign privateers did not last much past 1820, by which time foreign privateers had largely been driven out of United States waters. Slave dealers were, looked, were left to look for new sources of illegal slaves. Changes in the law and the way the laws were administered, along with actions of US federal courts, and developments in geopolitics all combined to hobble foreign privateering and destroy the ability of privateers to smuggle slaves. In the 18 teens, uh, late 18 teens, Congress strengthened federal slave trade law. Uh, most importantly, there's the Slave Trade Act uh, of, 19, of 1819 that empowered the president to use the armed forces to stop slave trading, not only in the United States, but also on the coast of Africa. Uh, there's also the indirect effect of laws aimed not at the slave trade specifically, but about foreign privateering, and those are very important. There were new neutrality laws that were enacted in 1817, 1818, and 1820, and these laws gave customs officers broad power to crack down on foreign privateers. For example, uh, one, law allowed, uh, one law established a list of U.S. ports that foreign, vet, foreign privateers were allowed to enter. Can I give you one guess of what port is not on the list? New Orleans, right. So the US ports are open, but not New Orleans. Okay, not, not Baltimore, which is the other major center of uh, Spanish American privateering. Okay, you can go to New York and go to Philadelphia, okay, go to Savannah, but not New Orleans. So that's closing down the access to those foreign privateers. Another aspect of the, of the laws that were enacted required foreign privateers to post a large bond with customs officers when they were heading out that would, you know, guaranteeing that they would not violate any U.S. laws. And the bond was so large uh, that it just made the voyages uh, too expensive to undertake. In 1820, Congress also made the slave trade piracy. We heard about that a minute ago. Uh, therefore, a capital crime. It may have had a deterrent effect. You know, I guess you don't really go out and commit capital crimes willy-nilly. Well, I don't. I, I, don't, I don't know you people. Uh, but there was only one execution uh, for slave trading as piracy, and that was uh, you know, when the very early days of the Civil War. So there's only so only one person was ever executed for that. So you know, the deterrent effect uh, may have still been there, but it was not from actual executions. The federal courts helped chip away at foreign privateering, and this is one thing I want to highlight because the the courts are often blamed for enabling foreign privateers. Uh, several scholars make the the argument that the court system just just let guys go. It wasn't really serious about cracking down on privateering. That the courts were complicit allowing uh, foreign privateering slave smuggling to persist. Um, I want to, um, to challenge that. Um, now, around the country, indictments for smuggling, slave smuggling, neutrality violations, piracy, there were a lot of them, hundreds of them. Convictions were very few. The results of the civil court told a different story, however. So if you go by the criminal courts, criminal courts have a very poor record of securing convictions of uh, accused pirates, slave smugglers. Not very many were convicted. Civil courts, though, civil suit was a different story. Uh, just as many cases, probably more cases, of uh, civil, civil cases involving violations um, undertaken by privateers. Uh, in those civil suits, privateers, the foreign privateers kept their prizes about 25% of the time, meaning that the other 75% of the time, they had to give up whatever property they had they had captured. These civil suits, these are, so you might be wondering, well, what's the civil court doing involved in these crimes? Uh, so there's civil aspects to the, their, their actions as well. So for example, the, the owners of the Spanish property or the, or the slaves, 
they would go to U.S. courts and attempt to get their property back. Or uh, customs violations, uh, the United States uh, Customs Service would sue in a court for the court to turn over the value of the goods smuggled. So those uh, are the uh, a couple examples of how they, these incidents end up in the civil courts. Okay. So officials were often frustrated by you know, only losing 25% of the time. They wanted to win all the time. But still, I think that went a long way towards striking at the underlying finances of the foreign privateering and slave smuggling. I to take them to civil court where they're more likely to win. Uh, the authorities are more, like to, like, more likely to win. Finally, changes in geopolitics emboldened U.S. authorities. The geopolitics also constrained the options available to privateers and smugglers, and the geopolitics reduced the demand for privateers overall. Amelia Island was the first to fall. In December of 1817, the U.S. military invaded. They ordered Ori to leave, and they dispersed the privateers and slave smugglers. In doing so, the United States had attacked Spanish territory, a step that they really hadn't been willing to do previously. But by 1817, relations between the United States and Spain were changing in ways that made the presence of an outpost such as Amelia increasingly dangerous to the United States. For years, the United States and Spain had been at odds over the limits of the Louisiana Purchase, as well as over other issues reaching back to the 1790s, issues that had never been resolved because the United States had severed relations when Napoleon invaded Spain. Relations resumed in 1815, and talks resumed at that time. Those talks eventually led to the Transcontinental Treaty. McGregor's invasion of Amelia threatened to upset those negotiations. To US officials, it appeared that Spain might lose the Floridas before Spain could give the Floridas to the United States. What's more, the instability introduced by McGregor's invasion and by Ori's later slave smuggling threatened to invite a move by a power such as Great Britain to seize the territory for itself. U.S. lawmakers had anticipated the danger of a non-Spanish power occupying Florida. In 1811, Congress passed a, a, a law called the, the uh, No Transfer Resolution, generally known that way. And that No Transfer Resolution empowered the president to occupy by force any Florida lands in danger of falling under the control of any power other than Spain. So somebody other than Spain might be taking Florida. The president is authorized to use force to stop that, to keep, keep that other power from getting those lands. Uh, the Spanish-American adventurers were not the first danger in vision when the law was uh, created. The president, James Monroe, judged that the diplomatic context warranted its application, the law's application, to Amelia Island. As for Galveston, President Monroe also considered a military response, but it was ultimately unnecessary. The Spanish, in time, had caught on to the Lafitte's double, deering, uh, double dealing. The Spanish realized that Jean and Pierre were simply leading them on and that they had no intention of destroying the privateers and filibusters who threatened Spanish rule in Mexico. It only took them like two or three years to figure this out. Uh, Spanish officials also realized that Jean and Pierre were attempting to inflame them against the United States with false information. Moreover, as the Transcontinental Treaty was signed and awaited ratification, Spain and the United States, which had been at odds over Texas, came to have the same interest. Their interest on both sides was to keep the peace and make the agreement work. Provocateurs such as Jean and Pierre Lafitte had to go. The Lafittes were astute readers of their situation, and they saw that the, the geopolitical tensions that they had exploited for over a decade very successfully were no longer working in their favor. In the spring of 1820, Pierre packed up their belongings in New Orleans. Jean uh, destroyed their buildings in Galveston, as the United States Navy watched in the distance. The Lafittes ended their smuggling days in the United States and headed deeper into the Caribbean to attempt to, ri to revive their business, with Jean becoming a privateer captain himself. It didn't work out. Uh, as time went on, the Latin American Wars of Independence wound down and the major sponsors of privateering had less and less use for new privateers. As the Lafitte's learned, the geopolitics that had driven their business had changed. Slave smuggling continued in much smaller numbers after foreign privateers had left the scene. 
the uh, Voyages database estimates that only 504 slaves landed in the United States after 1821. The, the, decade, the, the decline in slave imports occurred even as the domestic pressures that should have driven the trade grew stronger. So the demand for slaves is growing, but the smuggling of slaves is falling off. Uh, that leads me to point to the fact that geopolitics is the central factor here. So uh, the reasons for the decline are multifaceted. The laws changed, the navies of the United States and Great Britain became more active in their anti-slave trade patrols. Many of the now independent countries in Latin America abolished the international slave trade on their own. Uh, the geopolitics is decisive. The trade as it was practiced in the 1810s was often the work of foreign privateers unleashed by the Napoleonic Wars and the Latin American Wars of Independence and assisted by men like the Lafitte's who were very skilled at playing one state off against another to create room for themselves to profit. When the geopolitics changed in ways unfavorable to foreign privateering, slave smuggling declined as well. Even those slave smugglers who continued to work took advantage of discrepancies in international commitments to suppressing the slave trade. Slavers warded off inspections with false flags and concealed their vessels' nationalities with sham sales to foreign buyers. These tactics were based on, for, uh, on familiar principles, however. As the slave smuggling privateers had demonstrated, geopolitical realities were crucial to allowing Americans to profit by transporting human cargoes from abroad. That brings me to the end of my remarks today. We thank you again for, uh, for being a wonderful audience. And I would be happy to take uh, questions from you. And um, I, can, I can talk as, as long as you have questions. <laughs> thank you. Yes, I'll sign your book. Well, I should ask, did you buy it first? OK. Uh, that's the critical question. <laughs> yes? Uh, how and when did Florida become part of the United States? So Florida, the United States acquires Florida uh, in the Transcontinental Treaty. So the United States gets Florida. The United States gives up its claim to uh, lands in Texas. And then the United States gets uh, land going out to the Pacific Ocean, uh, Oregon Territory. So that's how the United States acquires they acquire Florida. Uh, Spain, Spain had lost effective control over it. Uh, it's demonstrated, I mean, Andrew Jackson invaded Florida. So uh, right, Spain just did not have control over Florida anymore, so that then they sold it to the United States. The United States wanted that as a priority rather than a place like Texas. Okay. I'm looking forward to when I buy a home someday to seeing, you know, you get the deed, right? I want to see it go back all the way to the Spanish, right, to when it comes to the United States. <laughs> I hope you can see that. All right, thank you, Dr. Head. All right, well, thank you very much. Yes, and um, I just wanted to, um, ooh, the, the microphone is dropping here. Hold on just a sec. Um, I just wanted to conclude briefly by um, providing kind of a brief synopsis of what we've seen today. Um, let's first give a big round of applause for Dr. Head and all our presenters. And again, the books are still for sale out there um, for those of you all who are interested in the topics. And um, this is a, a great place to come to hear refreshing history that um, is often overlooked. And so we, uh, we're very appreciative of the Friends of the Cabildo for sponsoring the symposium today. Um, outside the law, piracy and the illicit slave trade in Louisiana and the Gulf Coast. So in conclusion, I would just like to state that um, coming in this morning, of course, most of us are familiar with the legends that we um, are usually told through uh, tourism or just through folklore, both. Um, and so today, I think all the scholars have illuminated a large part of the reality of the illicit slave trade. So as we've joked, I mean, piracy is considered a sexy history, right? Uh, the slave trade is considered a very difficult history for all people to acknowledge and discuss. Um, it is getting, getting easier for people to acknowledge that, and I encourage, again, more dialogue about this today 
goes a long way towards in increasing that dialogue about um, the history of slavery and the slave trade here in the city. So certainly um, Dr. Davis and Dr. Head have focused on this period, the period of the 18 teens when the Lafitte's are at their peak. Um, it's the one of the great legends. Um, but really I think taken together that all the scholars have really pieced together um, a greater understanding of what the illicit slave trade encompassed. It wasn't just sexy pirates off of the coast. It was much deeper and also unfortunately much, much more brutal than is often portrayed in tourism. Um, and in particular, in, as far as the reality, uh, Dr. Greenwald, for example, has highlighted the fact that you could be born um, as a free person of color, imported to the United States, and then with the help of a notary, the complicity of the legal system, um, you were then enslaved in the US. Um, Dr. Sparks, has illuminated really, I think, quite the brutality of the international slave trade and the fact that the United States was uh, complicit in this overall slave trade despite the 1808 Slave Trade Act. And that, as he mentioned here openly, businesses um, ran slave trades out of New Orleans um, and then through Latin America and, and, and reaching into Africa as well, the coast of Africa. And I was really, really appalled at the fact that, again, the, the Uncas held 100, what, 150 in the 1830s, and then with the African slave trade, it had held 600 people. That is just um, quite brutal and unbelievable. And it really brings it home, the brutality of this trade. There's no sexiness about that at all. Um, and then um, Dr. Harrell, Kevin Harrell, has also eliminated the reality of this illicit slave trade that Randy Sparks had mentioned. Um, and really, it's quite fascinating that Mayor, that the man he focuses on, made this bet that he thinks he could go to Africa and bring some slave trade, bring some slaves um, to Mobile without any problem. Um, and that shows you just the, essentially the level of the complicity of this system overall, the fact that it existed. Um, so I guess my question is, how do we use this knowledge to um, make our society a better place? Um, and as we acknowledge, a lot of you are involved in tourism and interpretation. It's very important that we do acknowledge the brutality of the slave trade. Also the fact that um, Dr. Greenwald and um, the exhibit at the Historic New Orleans Collection has a, openly acknowledged the open slave trade. Um, but then the illicit slave trade is often forgotten. So it's important uh, to recognize the whole system overall. So I encourage you all, as um, you are ambassadors of our city and your scholars, um, to remind people about the brutality of this system, um, despite the idea of pirates being that attractive historical subject. So um, anyway, thank you all for coming. And uh, we will see you soon. So um, a, big, a big round of thanks to Jason Strada, executive director of the Friends of the Cabildo, and then also Ruth Burke, the president of the Friends of the Cabildo. So anyway, thank you all. Go out and have fun. Go out and um, hear some music. Go stop by Lafitte's Blacksmith Bar for a drink. <laughs> Raise a toast to Pierre.